Thank you, Dorian. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar on uh, locating and engaging with alumni for schools, colleges and universities. Uh, I'm Peter Buckingham and I'm the Managing Director of Spectrum Analysis and I'll introduce the first speaker in a couple of minutes, in a minute. Uh, we'll have a chat box running, which uh, Dorianne will drive and please feel free to give us your questions and uh, we'll attempt to handle those and answer them at the end of the session. Today's webinar is being recorded. We'll send that to you uh, for attending and thank you very much. This is the third webinar we have run. Uh, there are two other ones, one on mapping for schools and another one on demographics for schools and analysis and obviously the same for colleges and universities as all of them have similar issues. Uh, we have a long standing relationship with alum Grow Consultancy and with uh, 120 Ways Publishing in the area of education. At Spectrum, we turn your quantitative data, meaning what we can count and measure into visual tools, which can support the future decisions of your alumni planning for your school, college or university. For example, imagine if at the click of a button, you could see where your alumni live, what professions they have followed, are they a donor? Do they have any familiar ties? Do that family ties? And do they attend your face-to-face -face events? And are they staying connected and so on? At Spectrum, we know that understanding this one objective, your alumni, and being able to back your plans with data is essential to having a successful program. I'd now like to introduce you to our first speaker, Sue Elson. Uh, Sue works with us closely at Spectrum Analysis, and she's the founder of the Newcomers Network, Camwell Network, 120 Ways, and she's very much an expert in uh, LinkedIn and how LinkedIn can assist you with your, uh, I guess, engaging much, much better with alumni in the future. We can all read the rest on her screen, so I'll hand you over to Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Great to see some familiar faces in the audience. And uh, I look forward to providing this presentation. I'll just swap over the slides and uh, we'll um, go to LinkedIn for alumni and focusing on LinkedIn. Now, just to let you know, I've only got 20 minutes, so I can't go through everything to do with LinkedIn for alumni. But as Dori mentioned earlier, I will be actually providing these slides and that will be emailed out to you so that you can click on all the links and look up further information and definitely really encourage you to consider uh, putting questions in the chat because there will be a little bit of time um, for that as well. So just to give you a bit of background on me, I started my career six days after I finished year 12, uh, full time at Westpac in Adelaide and studied part time. And I moved to Melbourne in 1994, got a job, uh, lost my job and basically haven't had a real job since. So I call myself a geekster, a person who uses technology to attract aligned gigs. And I'm also a learning junkie. I go to between one and four events per week. I'm a social entrepreneur since 2001, which is when my first website went online, member of lots of associations, joined LinkedIn on the 21st of December 2003. So there's now 740 million members worldwide, um, but I'm member number 77832. I started consulting on LinkedIn in 2008, recognised by the Social Media Marketing Institute as one of the top 10 LinkedIn experts in the Asia Pacific region uh, in 2018 and 2019. They stopped doing it after that. Um, written two books on LinkedIn. I've actually written five altogether. And I'm an alumni of the University of South Australia and Henley High School in Adelaide, both of which I've provided LinkedIn advice to, uh, as well as lots of other schools, universities, conferences, uh, corporates, all sorts of people. So just to get a little bit of engagement happening, I'd like you to put a number one in the chat if you don't like selling and you like people to come to you. And I'd like you to put a number two in the chat if you actually like selling and you're okay hunting and finding people and trying to get them to be re-engaged with your school, college or university. So please just put a one if you like it. Uh, sorry, if you don't like selling and a number two if you do like selling. I, I did this for a business group and lots of people pick number two. So I'm really interested from the education sector, whether you guys like selling or not. So let's have a quick look at the chat. Oh, we've got 
quite a few twos in there. How interesting. Uh, and some ones as well. So a nice sort of roughly slightly swayed to the twos, uh, but some ones as well. So that's fantastic. Thank you for uh, contributing there. It's, it's great to see you all. Uh, now, I've also compiled a list of all the articles I've written that are relevant for schools, colleges and universities in my blog. So if you'd like to click on that link after this webinar, then you can see in a lot more detail the specific things I'm talking about here today. And I would really appreciate your feedback on what's been most helpful. And I had a student once tell me, uh, going to a session with Sue is like drinking water out of a fire hose because there's lots of information coming up. So please let me know what's been most helpful to you uh, later in, in the meeting here. So number one, I know this is boring, but you know we're all in an environment where we have to be compliant and take care of governance. And obviously, I want to encourage all of you to abide by the LinkedIn user agreement. There, are, there is a section number eight, which is do's and don'ts. Very easy to read. Don't need Alistair to help you with legal jargon in, in that particular section of the user agreement because he's a solicitor and barrister. Um, but, uh, you know, certain things I definitely do not recommend that you do is connect and pitch, which is sell people things. Uh, automate. You're not allowed to automate any processes on LinkedIn. So you can systemize things, but you definitely must not automate and don't aggravate. Please don't spam. Please don't use it for dating and don't be surprised. I've actually received a number of proposals as have many others. And I actually went to a conference one that's down in Geelong and a guy said, yeah, he knows a guy who uses LinkedIn for dating, which is far more successful than dating sites. So I don't recommend that. Uh, so please don't go there. Um, don't at mention inappropriately. So sometimes people put lots of at mentions with influencers, hoping that they'll then share content further on. Uh, that's not appropriate. Um, group messaging doesn't work either because everybody gets a copy of the message. Humble bragging, oh, I'm so fabulous, you know, here's my details, you know, doesn't sort of go down well in the Aussie ethos or sales messages, you know, come and, you know, fund our school uh, or college or university, not a good idea. But if you want to go down that sales path, so all those number twos in the chat, uh, feel free to follow that link and you'll get some more tips in there uh, to go through. And as I said, please put your questions in the chat. Now, you might be surprised to think that part of the information I give you is to update your own LinkedIn profile. You say, but no, I want to do it for the school, college or university. But if you're going to be representing your school, college or university, your profile needs to look good, as does the principal, head or vice chancellor, because, you know, you all look in, um, incredible uh, if you don't have good quality LinkedIn profiles. So I really encourage you to do that. The top uh, 10 brands in the world have 60% of their staff on LinkedIn. So that might be something you might like to aim for, but not just on LinkedIn, a good LinkedIn profile. Uh, some of us are over 50 uh, and we're worried about our wrinkles. Please do not be worried about that. Uh, just show your energy and vitality uh, in your photo. That's what people are really interested in uh, seeing. And Good also... at your office. This is Judy Reid. Well, we just need to meet Judy. Uh, so if you can take Sorry. care of that, Dory. Sorry. <laughs> uh, nice to see you, Judy. Um, My apologies. All good. And... Uh, um, there's a lot of different sections to complete on your LinkedIn profile. So if you can include some achievements in there. So it's not boasting, but if you say you've achieved X and Y in your role, it gives you a lot more credibility as well. There's a backup procedure. You can save your LinkedIn profile to PDF. You can also go into the back end and get a copy of all your data. So if you know somebody who's very influential in the school, who knows a lot of your alumni, you might be able to invite them to download their LinkedIn connections and then reach out to some of those alumni that way. Um, you also need to make sure that your school, college or university has a school profile on LinkedIn. So not just a company profile, but a school profile. So if you're not sure, um, you look at the URL, the link for your school, and if it has the word school in it, you're all good. If it has company in there, you can click that link and request it to be converted from a company profile to a school profile. So the two extra links I've given here are one to update your own profile. And the second one, if you decide to start writing articles, 
Now, I did some work with Corowa Anglican Girls School, which has just won an award for being a great employer to work for. So well done, Corowa. Um, but uh, the deputy principal actually wrote an article and had it published on her LinkedIn profile. So definitely encourage you to go that next level and consider doing that at some time in the future. So the next component is to build your tribe. Now, if you're in charge of alumni, you might be saying, well, that's all good while I'm in the job, but then what happens when I leave? All the connections I make with alumni will disappear. So what you can do, it's technically against the LinkedIn user agreement, but it's, it's worth trying for as long as we can get away with it. And you might call uh, somebody, Sam Henley for Henley High School, or, uh, or I did some work with Ormiston College up in um, Queensland, and we created a person called Ormiston Collegian. And I can show you that later if we've got time, but you can also click on that link. You could alternatively, like Turak College in Mount Eliza did, is create an alumni group on LinkedIn. Now, I actually don't recommend this because convincing people to join a group takes a lot of effort. Um, it's a lot easier just to get them to choose your school, college or university in the education section. Um, but that group has actually been very successful at helping the uh, old girls reconnect with one another, get job opportunities, travel internationally, all sorts of things, because it is an exclusive group only for alumni. So it's not even staff, it's only alumni of the school. So you can check that out if you'd like to see what that looks like. But ultimately, what I'm encouraging people to do is make sure that 80% of your students have joined LinkedIn and mentioned your organisation in the education section of their profile, either in year 11 for secondary schools or in first year of university. Now, just to give you an example, my daughter started studying at Monash and didn't like it, and then left and went to La Trobe University here in Melbourne. Um, but we've put both of those uh, on her LinkedIn profile because then she becomes an alumni of both Monash University and La Trobe. And in her Monash details, we've said she completed three subjects. And in the La Trobe, we've mentioned all the subjects and the fact that she got her degree from there. So getting students to do this whilst they're still part of your network is much easier than trying to find them afterwards. So don't try and go back 30 years and find all your alumni. Although I can tell you that Peter was very successful at doing this because he was organizing a reunion for the Campbellwell Grammar School. And he had a list of alumni from his year level and he just kept asking people, do you know this person, do you know? And he actually ended up finding all the people from his final year, um, you know, from 30 years ago. So it is possible to do that research. If you can't find them on LinkedIn, you might find them via a Google advanced search. And also if you run out of searches, you can use Google advanced search. You could also connect to people like Peter or others you know in the school who are good networkers. And you can also use other social media and alumni channels. So um, there's various graduate potentiality, alum grow, you know, all sorts of services that help you connect with alumni, as well as things like Facebook or the old fashioned Yahoo groups. Uh, there's lots of different ways to, to refine people if you want. You could even get students to do it as a project and get them to, to work out ways to, to reach alumni. But this particular article here goes into a lot more detail about that. Once you've got those people, or even from today, you can actually be what I call a personal encourager, somebody who engages with your alumni's content online. Um, and you can also, when you write posts, and a lot of schools, colleges and universities ask me, can we put the alumni stuff in the school stuff? Uh, because, yeah, it's kind of a different group. And I say, absolutely, if you put subjects at the beginning of your posts when you share things in the newsfeed. So I've got some capital letter post titles here, but if you'd like to see this in action, Knox Grammar School in Sydney do this really, really well. And they also add in YouTubes that they upload directly into their LinkedIn school page. And that works really well as well. So definitely encourage you uh, to also put those videos on YouTube first. So you can download your transcript. And then when you upload those videos into YouTube, the, uh, sorry, into LinkedIn, you can also upload the transcript. 
There's more information on engaging with content here, making posts go viral, and also uh, general strategies for your um, school page. Just try and make this work to the next slide. So if you're doing all those things, you then need to analyze and work out what works best for you. Um, do you want to try and attract people or push yourselves onto people? It's, so if you've got those processes in place of year 11 for secondary school and first year at uni or college, um, then that's you know really going to make this process a whole lot easier. Conversion, so getting those people onto the platform is key. Getting everyone involved, you know, from the principal to department heads to you know everybody else underneath, and also if there's any particular people who are champions, advocates, ambassadors, particular partners or VIPs, um, definitely encourage their behaviour online. And also consider your overall brand and reputation. So make sure your logo is correct, the description's correct, all of that kind of stuff. And as an employee of one of those organisations, there's lots of ways that you can support your school, college or university just by being on LinkedIn. So I definitely encourage you to, you know, support who you work for. I definitely do. And then there's that article link to, you know, all those school articles that I've written previously. Excuse me, Sue, we have a question from um, one of our participants. Yeah. And the question is, when we're talking to Year 11 students about LinkedIn profiles, what sort of conversations should we be having with their parents and more broadly, are parents supportive of this notion? Right, okay. Well, one of the schools that I went to, they actually had a parent information evening and um, I ran LinkedIn training, not only for the students, but also for the parents, because a lot of parents, you know, everybody in my view needs to have a LinkedIn profile. So some schools are concerned about doing it in the classroom because they feel that this is an external network and it's a social media and they need to get written permission. So different states have different rules about what schools are allowed to do. Um, but I've run workshops with Canterbury Girls, um, sorry, Campbellwell Girls Grammar in Canterbury, and they've had 97% of their students uh, join up to LinkedIn as a result of doing the workshop. So everybody gets joined up, you know, it's all advised to parents beforehand. We do the workshop, everybody gets on board uh, because that way they choose the school in the education section. The logo appears on all of the students' profiles. So that means any time someone looks at that student's profile, then you're going to see um, that logo on their LinkedIn profile. So it looks really good and, and really worthwhile. Yeah. Thanks, Sue. Any other questions in the chat? Uh, no, there don't appear to be any specific questions at this point in time. All right. So what we might do is I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll just open it up so that we can see everybody on the screen. So again, welcome. Um, if you'd like to unmute your microphone and share what's been most helpful, or if you have a question, uh, would love to hear that. Looks like everyone's being shy today, Sue. That's all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just go back and share my screen just so that I can introduce um, Alastair. Uh, and, you know, look, I'm more than happy to answer questions after this webinar. So uh, more than happy for people to reach out directly if you don't feel comfortable, um, you know, just saying something publicly. Um, as I said, there's lots of information in the slides that you're welcome to follow up with. So Alastair has been a part of Spectrum and, uh, you know, joined us uh, in a friendly business arrangement here. And uh, he is the founder and director of Alum Grow Consultancy. He's actually got a really extensive background in the education industry, but he started life out as a lawyer. So we'll forgive him for that. And, <laughs> and uh, but he, he's quite progressive from the point of view that he's a founding member of the, um, now let me get the, the details correctly here, Australian University Alumni Professionals Group, as well as a member of the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education. Golden Key International Honor Society, I'm a member of that too, top 15% of undergrads, and um, Educate Plus. Uh, so again, you'll be seeing him at the Educate Plus conference in Adelaide 
in September if you're going along to that. So without any further ado, I might um, escape from here and let Alastair share his slides again and uh, we'll be good to go. Would you like to share your slides, Alastair? Are you able to do that? Coming through, okay. Yep, perfect, thank you, I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Sue. Um, in terms of uh, what I'm going to be talking about today, you've got some, you've heard there from Sue about um, using LinkedIn and a few other, um, certain other tools that you can use to actually engage alumni and find lost alumni. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, a few other things that you can actually do uh, with your alumni in terms of engaging to get that sort of lifelong affinity in terms of getting more support from your alumni, getting them engaged in the life of your university or your school. And I think before I sort of start delving into some of those things, I'd like to share a few um, stats with you that um, just really sort of set the scene as to uh, what I'm going to be um, talking about a little bit later on. I think are important to understand in terms of the alumni industry as a whole uh, around the world, as well as here in Australia and New Zealand, because we have some unique challenges, I think, that our counterparts in the US and, uh, and the UK and, and Canada and things like that don't actually have. Now, in terms of some of those key metrics here, I think one of the ones to point out um, as an industry, as you'll see with some of those stats here, we're lagging quite significantly behind uh, the rest of the world in terms of Australia and New Zealand, in terms of our contactability with alumni, in terms of those that actually donate back to their institutions, in terms of our volunteering, um, all sort of lagging behind in terms of the rest of the globe. Um, now, some of that, you know, the industry is a much younger profession, I suppose, if you like, here um, in Australia and New Zealand as compared to the UK and US that have been doing it for, you know, well over 100 years now. Most it's it's fairly new concept here, really dating back 25, 30 years ago for most institutions. Some go back much further than that, obviously. Um, a few things that I also wanted to point out here that are that are a concern to me as a, a long-term, a 20-year plus practitioner in the field of advancement and alumni relations. Um, the 27% of our alumni programs have no dedicated alumni strategy around the world. That's a massive percentage. And I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of having that strategy set down formally um, very shortly. Just a, an interesting stat to share with you there. Another one, and, and it sort of shows that the importance of volunteer programs for both the here and now and for down off into the future, that 84% of alumni donors first donate their time or volunteer their time to your institution. And those who do volunteer give 56% more than donors who don't um, volunteer first up. It shows you the importance of getting your volunteer programs right and making sure you're engaging alumni, immersively speaking, in the, in the life of your school or your university because there's some great benefits further on down the track. Only 31% of um, institutions globally use return on investment as a tool to measure um, alumni success, alumni program success. That's a staggering stat to me because with your alumni program, and we'll talk about this in the next slide. However, it's very, very important to be running your alumni program in terms of, you know, you want to get some sort of return on investment back. We're not doing this to be nice people here. We want to get something back from out of our alumni to benefit our institutions um, going forward, um, whether it's now or well into the future. And it's, uh, it's about sort of striking that balance between the wants of alumni as well as the strategic wants of your, uh, your particular institution. The other concerning stat here that I wanted to highlight was 91% of institutions report they do a poor job of um, engaging with young alumni. Now, obviously, you know, Sue has um, talked a little bit about the social media aspect. There's certain other things you can actually do to help that some um, bring down that stat, I suppose. As an industry, we don't reach out to our young alumni um, well enough. We tend to sort of concentrate on those who can maybe donate their time or in a position to donate money, more so than forgetting about those next generations coming through and engaging them in such a way that um, they actually do want to give back in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time, whatever it happens to be. One of the, um, I suppose, one of the advantages, I suppose, of the COVID situation we've seen over the last couple of years that um, we've had a, a slight rise in annual giving, which is, you know, that's a, a positive step for the um, uh, alumni industry as a whole. Um, so it's just a few sort of stats here I want to sort of sh share with you, just sort of couch what I'm about to sort of say um, a little bit more clearly. Now, 
one of the most important things that you need to, I suppose, do, it doesn't matter whether you're setting out and starting a program from scratch or whether you've got a program that's been around for a long time is really establishing the, you know, the importance of your strategic why. Why do you choose to run an alumni program? And I think we often can get busy as practitioners and often forget the strategic why of what we do and what we're hoping to do down in, uh, down the track. And in my experience, you know, so going back over 21 odd years, is probably five key benefits that we get from running an alumni program. And these are the five, to my mind, that, that can flow from really those really great engaged alumni programs. One is they are brilliant to foster brand advocates and marketeers, if you like, for your, your institution. They really do help with volunteering and student experience opportunities. So things like mentoring programs, coming back and, um, and you know, giving a webinar or talking at graduations, whatever it happens to be, they actually help can help save you resources and save you staffing and time and money and effort through their volunteering. And um, don't underestimate the, the impact and the value of that. If you don't have great volunteering programs, now's the time to start. You saw the importance of it further on down the track uh, for fundraising and things like that later on. Um, benefit three for me has always been that building of influence with the industry and government. Um, so opening up doors that may be necessarily otherwise closed to your institution. I think it's an important role alumni can play. If they're leaders of industry, they can help open up doors that you may need open to achieve your strategic objectives as a school or uni. Uh, it's another important benefit they provide. Another one is, and it goes without saying really, but it's achieving those key advancement goals or development goals. So helping you build facilities, helping you with your um, scholarships and bursary programs, things like that, helping you with research programs and helping you to fund research programs for the benefit of not only the institution, but better but, um, of society and your students and things and more generally. Um, and five, all these go together to, you know, ultimately for benefit five is to, you know, to help insulate your school, your university against future economic pressures, things like, you know, when the next COVID comes along, you have funding there available to help, to, you know, um, release some scholarships to students that are doing it tough or to, um, you know, to make sure that you don't have to put staff off and things like that that we've seen very widespread right across the globe in education, unfortunately. Um, I suppose the thing to be, um, I suppose, to be wary of here in terms of the key benefits is that it's, um, it really does, I suppose, um, it's not a matter of setting and forgetting. These things should be reviewed each uh, and annually um, in terms of um, really sort of, um, yeah, as your program develops, it's not a matter of just, oh, we're just going to concentrate one or two. As time goes by, you will um, sort of expand your program. You will sort of go forward and, and you know, it, if you're a new program or, you know, a program that's sort of struggling at the moment, you might want to concentrate on the first couple of benefits, but eventually you want to build and um, and, and insulate your school against further um, um, you know, economic pressures and all that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, strategic-wise, as a pivotal to get them um, done from the outset because everything else flows from there and it's a, the benefits will mature over time. Forward. Now, I suppose having spent as long as I have in the industry, I want to share with you now, um, you've established a strategic why, a few light bulb moments that have, I suppose I've learnt over, uh, over my uh, career that I think it's important to share with you. It doesn't matter whether your program is a new one whether it's been around for many years, I think uh, a few of my learnings may sort of help, help provide some information, may help stop you making some mistakes that I've made along the journey there. And um, one of the major ones here um, is to find your program balance. It's probably the biggest um, the biggest tick that you can have with any program, uh, alumni program, is really sort of strike that balance between what the strategic aims and the, the goals of your school or university as compared to the wants and the needs um, of your alumni. And I love using this particular image here of the tightrope walker. So on one um, side of the tightrope, you've got your alumni and all their wants and needs and expectations of you as an institution uh, from their alma mater. And on the other side, you've got all the strategic needs and wants and goals of your school and university. Now, our tightrope walker is our poor little uh, our alumni relations office, or it might be an alumni um, um, association, foundation, whatever it happens to be. It's their job to really try and strike that balance. Now, with our tightrope walker there, if your program is geared too much towards alumni and uh, all about what they want, your tightrope walker is going to fall on one side. 
Conversely, the same sort of thing applies for your school. If it's all about taking for your alumni and not giving back, then um, then your program, again, is setting up to fail ultimately and your tightrope walker topples over. It's about striking that balance. And the very best alumni programs right around the world, they strike that balance. It's a 50-50 relationship between your alumni and um and your institution and it's uh, it's important to be able to sort of balance the two out um, and also if you're starting out or whether you're really looking to reinvigorate your program you know you need to seek to give back to your alumni first to really get that relationship happening before seeking then to you know to benefit from them and asking for things whether it's money whether it's time effort etc so it's one yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We just have a question from one of our attendees, Sam yeah. Johnson. Um, he's just wondering, um, are there best practice um, options or that you've experienced in terms of alumni volunteering programs? Best practice approaches. The best practice approaches is one is finding out what um, right from the very go again, it comes back to your strategic why as we talked about there before, but one of the best piece of advice as I can give is really find out, go to your alumni and find out what is going to make them sort of want to get involved. Now, you might think you might want a mentoring program and they might be saying something completely different. They want to get into tree planting, whatever it happens to be. Really do re, um, do your research really well um, to be, begin before you even, even you know hit send on that email to invite them to an event or whatever it happens to be. Make sure you do your research and you know do the things that uh, Sue talked about before. Do the um, um, demographic analysis and things like that that Peter doesn't get those customer personas happening because then you'll find out very quickly uh, with your research um, in terms of what is likely to make your alumni tick, what makes them tick, what are they likely to get involved with? Because you'll also find out doing your research and getting on things like LinkedIn, getting on doing your Google searches, you'll find out you know, where your alumni are at in terms of your uh, in terms of your volunteer programs. But one, just um, the other thing too, I suppose, is don't sort of overpromise and underdeliver on these programs either. Make sure that um, that when you have alumni, that you actually use them. If they're volunteered and put their hand up, find a way to use them. Even if you don't have a, an exact match for what they want to do, offer them something different. Don't just leave them hanging. Don't leave them out in the cold. Use them, get them involved. There are probably a, a couple of quick tips. Um, like it's been a whole day talking about that one, but um, ultimately do your research first and go to your alumni, do, do a survey have some focus groups, find out what's going to make them tick and then match that up against certain strategic things that you need for your particular institution that you're looking for alumni to help out with. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, a few more light bulb moments here. As I said, do your research and plan your how thoroughly. If you've worked out your strategic why, the how usually flows from that. So do your research. I can't stress that enough. I always promote the KISS method, so keep it simply sustainable in whatever you do, so ensuring your basics are sound in your um, organisation in terms of your alumni engagement. Um, you don't necessarily have to create anything new and fantastic to engage your alumni. Look at the things that you're actually doing as an institution now and how can you package up that? How can you leverage that to actually then engage with your alumni? Um, so if you've got, uh, I don't know, a school music concert you hold, you hold annually, annually, make sure that you invite your alumni along and give them the best seats in the house. It's an easy thing to do. It's no extra money involved, just a little bit of time. Um, just keep it sustainable um, for the long term because as we know in alumni relations, budgets are never what we would like. Um, and I, you know, nothing has changed over my entire career in alumni. So it's it's important to keep that sustainability factor about your program. It comes down to ultimately those meaningful or authentic touch points that are true to your brand. If you try to be something which you're really not, your alumni will see through it because don't forget your alumni have lived and breathed your institution at some particular point in their life and maybe for many years. So just keep whatever you do authentic and it's all about sort of fostering those relationships with your alumni to get that lifelong support, that lifelong affinity. That's what we're after here with alumni because that, you know, there's a lot of research shows if we can do that, then the, the nice benefits later on in terms of fundraising, et cetera, start coming into play. Patience is a virtue and consistency is a massive key um, um, in terms of alumni. If you're a new organisation, um, a new program um, at your school or uni, um, if you're expecting to get hundreds and thousands of alumni along to your events and interests and things, you need to think again and get realistic. Um, it's uh, ultimately, in my experience, you have to be very, very patient. So some of the work that you're doing now, you may not 
perhaps your institution may not see the benefit of for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But I guarantee you this, that if you are consistent and you keep that patience and you keep that um, consistent resourcing and the approaches around your program, that the wheel turns and you will get those benefits through. But it's very much that long-term game. Um, you must have a quality CRM system supporting you. If you're a, um, a school or union still relying on you know, things like Excel spreadsheets and things like that, please invest the money and invest in a good customer relationship management system because everything flows again from that it helps you manage your engagements with your alumni and then later on with your donors as well um, yes. it's worth the money every last cent of it excuse me alistair we just have another question that's come good. up from good. sarah Bersford, and that is um in terms of uh data privacy and risk are there any things to consider when you're washing your alumni database against, say, LinkedIn to locate and identify? Make sure that you have a written agreement where the provider that you're using is um, is not um, is not able to share or on sell your um, your um, your data. Is the main one. Make sure it's in a contract. And make sure it's very clear. Get it legal if you're unsure. Go to your university solicitor. Go whoever. Uh, uh, your legal rep is for your school get them to have a look at that contract as well before signing anything and make sure it's very very clear about the penalties that apply now i'm sorry to put my lawyer hat on here but um about the penalties that apply that um, should a, a party breach that um, i've never had an issue with it but i've always made sure i've had a, a contract in place and i've shared data to go and try and find lost alumni things like census things like using you know, companies to find your um, alumni via LinkedIn and things, I always have a contract um, in place to protect you against those things. There's nothing illegal about going on doing that. You, you can release your data. There's nothing stopping you doing that, but just make sure that um, they can't then sell that or keep it and use it for other purposes or other marketing purposes, because that will be the death knell um, for your program if, um, if you don't have that in place. So I've never had any issues with it, but also the other thing, use reputable companies. If you're not sure about them, ask somebody that has used them to make sure that um, they're on the level. But um, that's the best piece of advice I can give you is make sure you, you've got a contract in place. Thank you, Alastair, for that. Um very valuable information and also sue elson has put in some tips as well for Excellent. us thank Thanks, you sue. um annual magazine 10 year uh, reunion program is not enough in this day and age you want your alumni want immersive experiences they want to be involved in the life of your your school or uni so you know to build lifelong affinity that trust and that relationship it's, it's no good just sticking a, an annual magazine your alumni away and inviting them every five or ten years to a reunion. You need to do more and you need to be doing it consistently to get that engagement happening and get that sort of that affinity starting to grow. Um, consistent resourcing and support from leadership is vital for that sustained success is probably one of the biggest issues for the industry as a whole, not just here in Australia and New Zealand. Um, but um, it's very much that long term gain and you need to make sure that you're, you know, you're resourcing and you're, the way you approach your alumni relations is consistent. Don't again, don't over promise, under deliver. It's the worst thing that you can do because nothing erodes trust. Uh, more than that. Demonstrate impact to attract support. And I don't mean just demonstrating impact to your alumni and to your donors, but also demonstrating impact to your board, impact of uh, and the value and the ROI that, uh, that comes from what you do as a practitioner, um, from um, uh, what your program can do. If you can demonstrate that to your board, it becomes much, much easier to get that consistent, um, consistent resourcing and support from your leadership. Uh, so it's not just about demonstrating impact to your wider community, the people that matter are your board in terms of your resourcing. You need multiple communication channels and that includes hard copy. If you're thinking about getting rid of your hard copy magazine, I'm about to hit you with a stat that come from Morgan um, Institute was released last year that 62.8% of people over the age of 14 prefer a hard copy magazine to read as compared to an online version. So keep that in mind so that you need, you know, variety of age groups more than likely at um, as part of your program you need to be able to hit them with online hard copy face-to-face etc but um, think very carefully about the way you go about doing that um, and you know think very carefully about your approach to hard copy because you don't want it becoming a noose around your neck but you also want to make sure that you're not losing potential there to engage your alumni alumni programs need to value add to the lives of your alumni um, ultimately it needs to 
give them something over and above that their average life doesn't provide for them. Um, it's the best way of getting your alumni engaged. Face-to-face -face events, um, events are still very important despite what's going on in the last 18 months and a lot of stuff moved online and will be continue to be um, important down the track, but they must have a central focus. Um, it must be a, you know, a reunion or fundraising or whatever it happens to be and make sure it's got a central focus. The nondescript social me, um, social um, catch up at a pub or something like that that uh, a lot of alumni organisations do are a waste of time, my, in my uh, opinion, and uh, they don't bring much in the way of return on investment back. You need to, again, value add to your alumni. Big trend is that immersive experiences for um, organisations right around the world, not just alumni and education, but um, with sporting clubs, things like that. You know, the pushes from alumni and members, they want that immersive experience. Figure out how you can do that sustainably. How do you involve them in the, um, in the life of your school or your uni? Volume. Yeah, volunteer programs is a must, um, as we've sort of spoken about before. I'll just refer you back to that stat at the start about how important volunteer programs are in terms of future benefits and down the track. Um, neglect international based alumni at your own peril as well. Um, they are often the best, loudest um, um, proponents um, um, to sort of really shouting you, uh, the values of your institution from the rooftop. So don't forget your international and yet yeah, also your interstate based alumni because they can be, be your best and strongest brand ambassadors. So I'm just uh, touching on a couple of six sustainable alumni engagement tactics. Some you may want to consider for your own program. Some of you might be doing these already. Some of you uh, may be just starting out. So, but the um, thing I like about what I'm about to talk about. Um, uh, about these tactics is they are very sustainable. I shouldn't cost you other than time, won't cost you a lot of money uh, ongoing to actually implement. And they have multiple benefits. It's not just benefits for alumni or your institution, but they have community benefits. They have benefits to your staff um, and et cetera. So it's, it's not just a, a singular sort of benefit involved with them. Alumni webinar programs, myself and Dorianne, um, you've, um, you've met uh, there before, you know, we helped pioneer this in this country going back a long time ago now when we're at Deakin University and Deakin still has one of the best alumni webinar programs. And the premise of this is, is getting your alumni to come back and talk about things that they are expert in and giving a, a live webinar like what we're doing today, recording it, it gives you wonderful evergreen content. It throws a light on this fabulous sort of stuff that alumni are doing out there. Um, it throws um, a light on, you know, this is the value of our education as individual, look what they've gone on and done. Now have alumni talking about their area of expertise. You might have staff, so universities, an easy one is getting researchers love talking about their research. Come and give them, and, you know, have them talk about their area. It might be COVID or it might be, you know, uh, some accounting topic around tax time, whatever it happens to be, make it topical. And, uh, and you know, it gives you a record, make sure you record them because it's also a great way of then engaging your alumni in the state overseas that can't be there to, at your normal um, events, programs, and things face to face. It gives them an in and gives them a professional development tool as well as a, a, a tool of um, professional interest, I suppose, if you, if you like. Social media, again, is probably one of the still one of the most underutilized things in alumni, and particularly in this country. Um, Sue sort of touched upon this before, but you should be aiming to have your standalone alumni channels as distinct from your, your generalized. Um, um, university or school channels um, because ultimately alumni I've, I've spoken to many experts about this they all say the same thing you should have a standalone channel because alumni want to hear about things that are important to alumni they're not interested in staff or was an internal based sort of stuff they want to hear about stuff that's important to them and the best way to do that and to stop it getting lost in maybe translation if you're using your um, you know your school um, general channel um, is, to, is to have your own and you know if you know resourcing is tough and tight and things like that start with just one or two channels and do them really well rather than trying to you know bring on four or five channels and not do any of them very well just uh, whatever you do just you know start off small and then grow it from there as you get more resources then you can expand channels and things like that um social media ambassador programs are really starting to take off in the states they haven't sort of taken off so much here yet but it's a bit of a cutting edge one at the moment is actually tapping your alumni on the show and say hey put our stuff out through your own channel especially if you've got alumni or influencers or the big followings on their social media 
you can have a bit of a formal program with them where, you know, when you put out a, um, a tweet or you put out a post on on uh, Facebook that you actually um, invite them then to, to do the same and put that post out through all their networks. It's a wonderful, easy way of, of spreading your network and quite quickly, particularly if you're starting from, from a low base. And a good um, um, a, um, university example of that is have a look at Campbell University. I think they're in North Carolina and the States um, who are really um, doing some really great stuff in that. So have a bit of a look at them at the end of this um, this uh, webinar. I also have fun with your social media as well. Those things like Throwback Thursdays and Fun Fact Fridays and running competitions, things, they work. I, I'm still surprised not enough schools and universities do it put up some old photos and you know and have alumni actually uh, um, you know point out some you know um, themselves and you know a photo back from 40 years ago that sort of stuff it's a great and easy easy way of getting um, a following in terms of your social media but also engaging and it's also um, amazing how alumni then um, sort of I suppose um, self-identify themselves and identify others that you may not necessarily have contact with um, in the past so yeah, think about how you can have fun with your social media and make it engaging alumni recognition and awards programs they're brilliant for brand building engagement marketing not a lot of schools do these things most universities have a pretty good recognition awards program have a look at the Deakin one I created it um, but uh, but I might be a little bit biased there but I still think theirs is one of the best going around and they've added to it since I I was there, but um, really a great way of sort of really throwing the light on the great things that your alumni are doing, but also throws it back on your brand as well and how good your um, how good your school is, what the impact that's actually had on this individual. And said, so, like, you know, and uh, I can help you put those things, sort of things together if you use Lumber Consultancy. Alumni Significance Register is another one. Um, you've heard of top prospect lists, fundraisers, then you should also have one or aim to have one with alumni. Um, so your alumni significance registers can be what it is, can be what you want it to be ultimately. Uh, so it might be alumni of one major award, so either internal or externally, uh, alumni that are head of industry or head of government or you know might be minister or whatever it happens to be you have alumni of significance register that you to do some research in it takes time to do that and then they should be your first point of call when you're looking for guest speakers when you're looking for awards nominees if you're you know, looking to um, you know, have alumni uh, volunteers and things they should be the first port of call for that sort of stuff and you've got got them then to then transition them slowly to into that top prospect and you know potential you know, making donations and things later on. Immersive volunteer programs, as I've talked about, mentoring programs is the obvious one there. Um, start small with your mentoring program. All good alumni programs should have a mentoring program associated with them. There's a lot of um, uh, platforms, things you can buy and can help you actually um, um, uh, do these things and manage the program. But just make sure that um, you start off small pilot a program first before making a leap and buying in a you know, fairly expensive you know, software program, whatever that can help um, you know, manage that sort of process. But just make sure that it's, it's going to be a program that's supported first before making a leap into something more substantial. Micro internships is another one that I love. Um, it's, again, it's, it's starting to take off in the States, not so popular here in Australia yet. I think it will be. And that's where you offer the opportunity for groups of your students to go and help um, alumni in a specific area of their small business or a particular area of their professional life. So it might be a 15 or 20 hour project that alumni really need help with. So a real life scenario. So it might be they need a, a, you know, a, a software program to help them sell goods online, for instance. So you can get alumni to come in and start developing those, um, those um, um, students to actually help those alumni develop those programs. It's a great way of developing student work skills and helping your alumni in the process and engaging with them, giving them something of value. And a great one uh, to look at is Longwood University over in the United States who are pioneering this. Um, Ryan Catherwood over there is a mover and shaker and head of that program. Have a look at Longwood University in the States because it's um, it's a great program we've got going there. I just want to leave you quickly now with my 10 plus one rule playbook for effective alumni engagement. And um, we've spoken about this um, and hopefully you'll really to try and bring everything together that I've spoken about very quickly. Yes. Firstly, you know, do your research and have that written alumni engagement program, uh, program with clear and realistic objectives. You know, make sure that you can measure ROI and that you have you know, KPIs set against that to, you know, to keep you on track and make sure that you're getting benefit from your program. Engage your alumni authentically 
and transparent in the life of your institution. It's the best way to build trust and engagement and affinity. You know, thoughtfully engage your alumni using a strategic combination of hard copy online face-to-face -face, as we've talked about. Alumni relations, it's that 50-50 relationship, strike the balance. It's not all about you, but it's not all about your alumni either. It's about striking that balance and that's where you'll get that real success. Seek to fundraise unapologetically from your alumni as well. Just don't do it when you at first instance. If you're alumni, you found alumni and they haven't heard from you in 10, 15, 20 years, the first communication shouldn't be asking them to do something. It should be offering them something, offering them something of value, not just um, seeking to fundraise from them. Over time, you build that narrative into that, but don't be apologetic about seeking to fundraise because ultimately we're not doing this to be totally good guys here. We want something back from our alumni down in the long term. Incorporate alumni and donor stories within your marketing and prospectus in your, you know, your course materials, things like that. Demonstrate their impact. So it's a great way of showing, well, this is where our education can lead you off into the future. And make sure you include your donors. You know, have stories now. This is why I donate to my old school because it's X, Y, Z. And that's a great way you know, for prospective students and also their families to get a bit of an idea about what your brand is about and where it can lead to. You can never thank your alumni volunteers and supporters enough. Never forget that. Just do it authentically and keep it on brand. Your CRM, as I said, it, that is the true rock star. Everything is the bedrock around that, ultimately, with um, having a good CRM to manage your alumni engagement. Don't get despondent over lack of resources. It's a fact of life with alumni engagement and advancement in particular. Um, you know, try, don't get bitter about it, get better about it. You know, demonstrate your impact to your board better, demonstrate your impact to your community better. Uh, you'll get that resource and will come through if you find that the magic key there. And view advancement as the true profession it is and be an active participant. Go to things like the Educate Plus conference later in the year. Go to case conferences, get involved in things like this and share your experiences with others. Um, I can't stress that enough because you have a high churn rate and uh, we need all to keep that experience within the profession and share it around. And my 10 plus one rule, my 11th rule there is don't forget the above 10 rules and above all, have fun. I don't mean to say have fun in a flippant sort of way. In my experience, again, um, if you are having fun, your staff are having fun, it will permeate down through your program and all of a sudden your alumni start having fun, fun and that affinity sort of starts coming through and just um, just keep that in mind. So, um, there's my uh, 10 plus one rule playbook. Um, I said it, uh, this uh, will be sh shared with you. My slides and things will be shared with you um, after we're done here today. But um, if you've got any questions, please shoot them through. There's my contact details. Well, I've written uh, quite a number of blog articles over the last 18 months or so in particular. So get on our blog, it's open to the public. And uh, a few things that I delve into to a little bit more depth with mentoring programs and things like that. So, but uh, look, thank you for, for listening and I'm happy to take any, uh, any questions. Thank you, Alistair. That's terrific. Um, there don't seem to be any specific questions um, at the moment directed at you. Um, but as uh, Alistair mentioned, um, when if you think of something after um, this presentation, uh, you'll be able to connect in with Alastair, Sue or Peter or myself, um, either via email or our contact details, which were shared. Um, following the presentation, we'll be sending a link to the recording and also um, all of the presentations that you've seen here today. Dory, there is a question from Sheridan uh, mm -hmm. for Alastair. When you say offer your alumni something before you ask for something, what is an example of what we can offer? Please come along and have a um, and come to our school music concert. It's a very easy one. Um, and you know, your tickets are on hold. Please get in contact with us. Give them something very simple, very easy. You don't have to create anything new, um, Sheridan, but um, just um, offer them something that they wouldn't have otherwise got. Um, but something like that is very, or invite them along to, a, you know, the next footy match to school playing or whatever it happens to be, stuff like that. Easy thing to do. And it's offering them value, something that they wouldn't have otherwise got or invite them along to your next webinar or your next event. Don't be sort of sort of saying, look, we need money for a building. Uh, we need your time. We need your effort, that sort of stuff. Start with giving them something very easy and very simple. Yeah, I'd, I'd also like to add from the business world, if you have a round table with the principal or something where you get somebody really significant and it's exclusive only for the top alumni ambassadors or something like that, that can be 
you know, really well received as well. Uh, anybody Thank else you. unmuted, Dori? Uh, doesn't look that way. Ah, Raquel's got a question though. How do uh -huh. you measure impact efficacy of an alumni program? Do you have any case studies or best practice examples to share? Um, I do. It's one that I actually created um, <laughs> many years ago and implemented. Dora will know this. Uh, okay. Deacon also implemented at the University of Tasmania. Um, but uh, it's about measuring positive engagement with her alumni. And by that, I don't mean um, something that you do. So sending out a, a magazine, say, to alumni is not a, uh, an example of positive engagement. It's what comes back from that, whether alumni comes back and updates their details or they send you a nice email saying this is great. It, prompts them to come along to an event, whatever it happens to be, measure your positive engagement. You should be sort of per head, um, have some sort of um, sort of figure in mind in terms of how you actually, um, how successful your program is. Now, as a starting point, um, start with two positive engagements per alumni member per year and, and grow from there as a good starting point. Um, when I've done this over many years, you, get, you can get it up to about four to five positive engagements per year. Um, and positive engagement can be everything, anything from attending an event to a website hit to a phone call to donating, that sort of thing. On the other side of the fence is obviously what you get back in terms of money and volunteer hours. And a great way of um, doing that um, is obviously money is an easy one in terms of um, donations, things that come from alumni. A harder one is volunteer time. And it, it means keeping your records um, uh, up to date and doing your, you know, doing your due diligence around this, but actually putting a dollar figure against um, volunteer hours. Because if you're going to your board and saying, okay, we've had 100 alumni have donated their time over the course of this year, as a board member, and this comes from feedback from um, boards that I've worked with over the years, they'll, they'll think, whoop de do 100 volunteers, what does that mean? If you can say that the value of those 100 volunteers is, 50 grand a year, then it becomes a much more powerful argument that you can take to your board, that you can report to your board to get those extra resources in. And, you know, you can use things like you know, Australian Bureau of Statistics have, um, you know, average wages. So if you've got a, you know, a, a solicitor, for instance, that has donated their time, you're looking at two or $300 an hour um, per time. So you know, there's some great resources there on the Australian Bureau of Statistics that actually break down each particular employment category and you can put those and marry those up against your alumni to actually, as I say, well, 10 hours from that solicitor is worth, you know, $3,000 uh, to our institution through volunteering for our mentoring program, whatever. So there's a few different ways you can actually do that. Um, but um, they're probably the three major ones is positive engagement. Um, donations that come in and that includes goods and, and, and chattels and things like that, put a value on them and the, putting a value on um, your volunteer hours worked. It's the most yeah. effective and valuable thing that you can take to a board in my experience. Yeah. Alistair, we've technically got one minute left. So I'll just go back to uh, the final slides and Dori, if you can just go through the, the final messages and then we'll leave the, uh, the, the webinar open if anybody would like to um, ask any other questions. So there's a slide there today of the, um, the speakers that we've heard from and their contact details, and we'll be sending that to you um, in the post-event, uh, post-webinar email. These are the upcoming events where Peter Buckingham and Alistair Lee will be at Educate Plus conference um, in September, and also Spectrum Analysis will be at the AHESA conference um, in September as well. Uh, and just finally, thank you to everyone for participating with us today. We hope you've received and heard some valuable information. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media. We'll send you a link to the recording and we welcome any Google reviews. Thank you. Okay, so we'll just open it up for any uh, questions from the group, if there's any other questions that people would like to ask. Oh, we've got some lovely messages of thanks uh, yes. from uh, various people here. So from Raquel, from Sheridan, from Vanessa, Madison, Bruce, Magella, uh, Adarin, Brendan, Emily. Oh, wow, aren't you all so well behaved? How lovely. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice to see. Really appreciate those comments. Yes, thank you. And see, Rocco, did you have a question? Your microphone's unmuted. No? Perhaps not. 
CRM, recommendations, potentiality from Hamish. I'll let you answer that one, Alistair. Um, there's, well, there's, um, there's a number of um, CRMs that, um, that are available to use that are, that are very good. Um, a few that I have used in the past have um, been Blackboard. Uh, potentiality is, is one that I think I saw mentioned there. Um, Synergetic, you can buy in modules to help you with your alumni. And if you've got a Synergetic system already, I would probably recommend you go down that route rather than buying it something completely new. Because I said I've used Synergetic when I was at Sacre Coeur and uh, it's, a, it's a very fine program and does everything that you'll need it to do. Razor's Edge, uh, Clearview, um, Luminate, CRM is another one that's pretty popular over in the States as well. So there's a, a handful there that you may want to look at. I suppose with CRM, just do your research, um, make sure you get a live demo, make sure they give you 24 seven support. Um, and uh, also don't be afraid to barter on price. Don't take their first price um, that they, they give you. Um, I hope no one's around from these companies that are tuning in today but some um, make it there is one up. Alistair <laughs> we've got two can tech here who said they have a CRM so we'll give you a, a quick plug there if you'd like to just unmute and just mention the details of your CRM yeah hi this is Marin from two can tech I run um, uh, the region here for Australia and New Zealand so we are reasonably um, new to the Australian New Zealand market um, but yeah we've got a lot to offer in terms of CRM alumni can support you with fundraising. Alistair, we can even track volunteer hours in the CRM so you can put that value back to your boards. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, happy to take any um, chats um, and yeah, follow up with any um, inquiries. Just reach out to tucontech.com. That are you. Thank you for mentioning that. I worked with a school in Tasmania and they you know, really enjoyed your product. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today. Anybody else like to unmute and share a comment or ask a question? Emily's asked how soon will the recording be available? Uh, as soon as the webinar is finished, we'll be uploading that to YouTube and uh, then we'll be sending out the email with the slides and the link to the YouTube recording. So you're welcome to share that with anybody who may find it useful. Amazing, so speedy. Yes, well, Peter runs a, a data and <laughs> a, a business. So yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. We want to give you this information as quickly as we can. Peter, would you like to unmute and make any final comments as well about uh, how you've helped schools uh, with your services? Just unmute first. Looks like I might need to get Peter to unmute. <laughs> I'll, I'll unmute you for you here. That might work. <clears throat> Looks like he might be coming out to Dory. We've unmuted you, Peter, so you should be able to mention something now. I've just come out with Dorianne, and uh, thank you very much for coming to our webinars. We are going to keep uh, running these on a regular basis. Obviously, there are other uh, parts that can help for your alumni, including mapping and things like that, the Spectrum Company does. So we'll really look forward to it. And I don't think Sue quite uh, mentioned that she is also going to be at the Educate Plus conference. And I expect uh, Dorianne will also be there as well as myself and Alistair. So I think we're going to book a book a party house. <laughs> I haven't quite worked that out yet, but we'll be working. So anyway, look forward to meeting everybody. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Take care. And Yamuna, you're unmuted. Did you have a question you'd like to ask? Sorry, we couldn't hear that, Sue. Uh, Yamuna is unmuted. Would you like to ask a question? No, guessing it's just because it's on the iPhone. So, yes. All right. Last chance for any final questions before we wrap up. You can get back to your day. I think we might be done, Dory, if you'd like to do the final yes. close. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Once again, we'll be sharing the recording and the presentations with you this afternoon. So check your inbox for that arrival. And thank you again. And we hope to see you sometime again soon. Bye for now.